Hello, everyone. I'm Thane Rosenbaum. I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo University. And welcome to the folks' Conversations on Essential Cinema. It is one of our new wide, wildly uh, popular series. We've hosted a number of classic films with classic guests like Sharon Stone and Matthew Modine. Uh, and tonight, where our film is Chariots of Fire, uh, the 1981 classic, which won received four Oscars, one for Best Picture and one for Original Score. Everybody knows the score. It's like almost like the James Bond theme. Uh, it, it tells the story of uh, the British Olympic team in the 1924 Olympics, uh, and specifically two runners, a Christian runner and a Jewish runner, uh, and both influenced by their faith and their religious identity. Uh, one is Eric Little, and the other is uh, uh, Harry Abrahams. Um, the film is an absolute classic, was a surprise hit, and is always a, a beloved sports film. And we have the perfect, the absolute perfect guest to discuss it. We have the great Jeremy Schapp from ESPN. You know him from his, hey, Jeremy, welcome. Uh, we we know Jeremy. Great to be here. Thank you, Thane. I think I'm we, we know Jeremy from his series on ESPN, both uh, E60 and Outside the Lines. He's won multiple Emmy Awards. He brought a kind of cerebral social justice sensibility to ESPN. And with that, he brought a lot of awards to ESPN. He's also known in an interesting way as a broadcast journalist and a writer about sports because he really does cover world sports uh, uh, in a way that is unusual and he it is a part of his specialty. So you'll oftentimes see him like last week and this week covering the World Cup, but he also covers European soccer and of course the Olympics and Tour de France and Wimbledon and the French Open. You'll always see him when it comes to, it's, he'll, he's, it's not like he has a problem with American sports competing around the world. <laughs> it's just that when they have to leave America, for Jeremy to really be interested. <laughs> so he, he's really great at that. And, and he's also really, his award-winning programs have hit on issues dealing with racism and sexual violence. And he's sort of a really important figure in sports journalism and in journalism uh, in, in general. Uh, he's also the author of a number of really great books, one on Jesse Owens and Hitler's Olympics in Berlin in 1936, another on Jackie Robinson, another book, uh, on called Cinderella Man, which uh, I'm not sure it was made from his book, but it was a Ronnie Howard movie uh, that's based on the fight from James J. Braddock and Max Baer. So he's constantly busy. He's got an original mind and a lively mind. And we're really grateful and thrilled to have him with us tonight discussing this really important, original, uh, interesting sports film, very much unlike lots of other sports films, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, before we start with Jeremy, if you have a question for him, uh, you can leave it in the Q&A box. We have a global audience for this, so it'd be great if someone from the UK has a, has a question for Jeremy. Um, and if you're watching us live on YouTube, welcome. We love having you from YouTube. Don't forget to come to folks.org and also give us your email address so you'll be uh, notified of future events. Jeremy, uh, I called you and invited you, your friend, to say, look, this would be a perfect series for you. And I said, and of course, just like we did with Sharon Stone and others, uh, Elizabeth Holtzman, by the way, she picked uh, 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 the, all the president's men, not surprising, of course. Uh, I said, Jeremy, it's your film. You picked the film. So you picked this, but you had some other films in mind. Let's well, just tell the audience, did you have other films or did I give you Films. I think I know I mentioned Hoosiers I, to you. Oh, yeah. You know, I don't remember to tell you the truth, Bane. <laughs> um, but if well, I. Well, then just tell us why. Why did you want it? Why did you pick this film? You know, I love this film. I mean, that's the basic reason. And it was just last night I rewatched it. It might have been the first time in 15 or 16 years that I had seen it. And, you know, you're always a little nervous, right? There's always a small degree of trepidation, like, is it going to be as good as I remember? Is it going to move me the same way? You know, when you're, I'm 53, the way it did when I was 12 years old when I first saw it, or, you know, that, that's how Do you, do you how remember seeing it at 12? And also for the I, audience that doesn't already know, pretty much everyone I think knows, Jeremy Schapp is the son of the legendary sports broadcaster, Dick Schapp. So I can only imagine going to the movies with Dick Schapp to see Chariots of Fire must have been a real privilege. I, you know, 
I don't remember. I, it would have been unusual for me to go to the movies with my dad. We didn't go to the movies together very often. He was so busy, but I went a lot with my grandfather and I definitely went to see it when it came out in the fall of 1981. And I remember just being um, enraptured. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, and watching it again last night, I saw it and I said, you know what? It's still great. It's a great movie. And it's an, insp it's an inspirational story. And uh, the way that the story weaves uh, Eric Little's story with Harold Abraham's story, it, it's so well done. There's, of course, as you mentioned, that iconic score from Vangelis, yep. which is just unforgettable. And um, I think 12-year-old me, I was a big Olympic enthusiast. You mentioned my dad. He was a big Olympics guy. He was a preeminent Olympic historian. He wrote one of the kind of essential histories of the Olympics. And, you know, when I was a kid, he was always away at the Olympics, you know. In, in By the those... way, in the Dick Schapp book about the Olympics, is there something about some portion about Little and Abrahams? Very little, actually. <laughs> and I looked it up last night. It's funny you should ask, because I went back, you know, I remember talking about Harold Abrahams with my dad um, and Eric Little. And I went back to read the chapter. He wrote it. Uh, he wrote his history of the Olympics um games by game so you know a chapter for 1920 in antwerp a chapter for 1924 in paris so i went back and i reread paris last night and he focuses there's really like one major character each chapter in 24 i was thinking maybe it would be abraham's but it was actually johnny weissmuller oh wow and and so there's very little about huh. little and abraham's in there well you know it's interesting 1924 i looked this up this is obvious to you, not so obvious to me. 1924 was the first Olympics that was broadcast on radio. Mm. I didn't so realize that's, that. that's interesting, right? Because you can imagine that, you know, this is after World War I, the world suddenly got very close together. <laughs> the world looked smaller at that point, I suspect. That's right. And, and, and instead of reading about the Olympics in your daily newspaper, you were probably listening. I don't know if it was live coverage, Jeremy, but it was the first time that you could turn on the radio and listen to, you know, the American team uh, in competition. And so there are some interesting things. And, and of course, you know, in the movie, it's it's a subplot of the movie, but there's an American team. <laughs> and yeah. it just so it just so happens that uh, was it Jackson Schultz and uh, Charlie Paddock. Yeah. You know, there's sort of a race among four men, two Brits, two Americans, to be the world's fastest man. That's right. right. When when but when you were a really little boy, Jeremy, there used to be this thing about Bullet Bob Hayes, the True. world's fastest man. I don't know whether all the Olympics had that idea, but surely after Hayes in 1964, the whoever won the hundred. No, no, was, it was long before that thing. I mean, you know, Jesse Owens obviously won the hundred and thirty-six. Yeah. And they yeah. used that term of art, the world's fastest man. The wow. world's fastest man. Yeah, it was definitely used, I think, by 1924. Um, Eddie Tolan won in 32 in Los Angeles. Um, I'm trying to remember who won in 28. And then Harrison Dillard won in 48. Uh, uh, Lindy, uh, yeah, whoever won was the world's fastest so man. And that goes back, I think, before Jesse. Well, what's interesting, and you would know that because you've written about Jesse, what's interesting about that is that it's not mentioned, but it's implicit in the movie that the world's fastest man might have really been the guy who wouldn't race on Sunday. He just right. wasn't, he wasn't able to run the hundred. <laughs> he was able to win another Olympic medal in a longer distance, but the title, the world's fastest man who went to a Jewish British runner in 1924 might have gone to a Scottish British runner. And I'm also wondering when in your own research was uh, Schultz and Paddock, were they, were they upset essentially, not emotionally, but were they considered the prohibitive favorites? You know, that, that's a good question. And in preparation for our conversation, Bain, I admit I called a buddy of mine, <laughs> uh, Dr. Bill Mallon, who is a fascinating person. He was a PGA, tour pro golfer in the mm -hmm. 70s. He's widely considered one of the two or three leading authorities on Olympic history period, track and field um, especially. 
And he's also he was all, he's also one of the most eminent shoulder surgeons in America, a longtime team doctor at Duke. And Bill knows everything about the Olympics. And I said, I asked him that exact question. He said, there just really weren't such things by 1924 as upsets because the Americans and the Europeans competed against each other so infrequently. I see. They didn't see each other enough to know, you know, it's not like today where they're taking, you know, they're racing against each each other in Oslo and Zurich and Milan and, you know, all year long for years and years um, because they're pros, they can keep doing it for years and years and years in a way that they couldn't back then. So he said, not really an upset because people just didn't know. Um, so it's interesting, though, you just reminded me there's a scene in the movie. See, today we take for granted that the immediacy on YouTube or anywhere that we can watch, you know, some high school football game and someone score a touchdown f- from an hour ago. Right. right. And we could then decide whether Alabama would be interested in bringing that guy, making that person offer. In the movie, there's a scene with a 35 millimeter projector where the the Italian Arab coach of Abraham's is showing him some video, some footage of Paddock and Schultz. Right. Right. right? And it's interesting that that's it. That's what we got. We don't got anything else. We got yeah. a, we, we have and those guys were Olympic runners, you know, along those lines. Um, Thane, one of the things, I don't know, it's one of those scenes in the movie that even though I know it's coming and I know exactly, you know, the <laughs> scenario, it really moved me again watching last night. It's Sam Musabini, Harold yeah. Abraham's his coach, and he's not at the stadium, yeah. but he's within earshot of the stadium. And, and, and explain to the audience why he's not there. You know, you know, I, in the movie, I think- There's I, only one scene- that they he's on the field and they don't seem to be happy. Right. right. And he that's, says, I'm that's not, doing not an business. Olympic competition. He just says, I'm that's, not doing any business. It's a but there, is there a scene in which is there an impression that they said to him, You're paid for this, get out of the stadium? That's right. You know, that's it. You know, you're a professional. Um, these are the Olympic Games. Uh, you know, we uh, abhor professionalism. And uh, I don't know what the real situation was. I'm talking about the movie as you right. are. And so Musabini is not allowed to be at the stadium. He's not allowed to have a credential anyway, be anywhere near his runner, Harold Abrahams. And so he has no idea specifically when the race is going yeah. to be run, the hundred yeah. meter final. And he's, he's waiting and waiting and he's pacing, he's pacing the small room and he's got the windows open so he can hear it. And finally he hears God save the King, <laughs> yeah. which signals to him, that the only subject of King George V, who's running in the final, has won the race. You know, this is something he I wanted. Uh, this is his something... hand through his the hat, his, his bowler, right? And he and Boater. he starts to and he starts to cry. Yeah. Actually, this that you you in you, home. You, so uh, you you brought me to a question I wanted to ask you later, but now's as good a time as any. You know, we we take for granted that the Olympics are competitive events not just against individuals, but against nations. Mm. And they pr- there's a processional parade on the opening day. We see it all the time. And they all come in marching with their flags. And then there's a medal count. So everyone's yep. keeping tabs on how many medals you've won. And, you know, it's not clear that the ancient Greeks saw it that way. So it is. it does raise an interesting question when you well, say- Well, that's not the way Baron de Coubertin saw it. Exactly. You know? And right. it's interesting, like that- you reminded me when you said it's not until he hears the the national anthem for the gold medalist that you would even know. And then I'm thinking, and we've seen controversies with that in 1968. Remember there were two American sprinters that were, you know, put up uh, their fists wearing black gloves in protest, right? Two sprinters. So the, the, that, that ceremony is very evocative. And I'm wondering whether, it's a good thing or a bad thing, right? It's very dramatic. It made it made it's, it's a scene that made you emotional. That yeah. that's right. But it's an interesting question. That is that something that is so essential or fundamental? By the way, does Dick Shap's book go into this idea of the the marching in with flags yes. and the patriotism? It, it it is very interesting, and you know, I'm I'm not an Olympic historian, a general Olympic historian, you know, on the order of a Bill Mallon or right. David Wallachinsky. 
Um, but, you know, Baron de Coubertin, who is the father of the modern Olympic Games, the French uh, nobleman, you know, and initially the idea was, right, they had gotten beaten so badly in the Franco-Prussian War right. um, that, you know, th there were there were elements in French society that thought they had to do a better job of training, physically training French youth. Hmm. And then, you know, the idea evolved over time into something more of like, um, you know, the idea of, a, you know, the brotherhood of humanity coming together, you know, as one. And that seems to run, um, uh, you know, in the opposite direction of medal counts exactly, and flag ceremonies and all of that. But, you know, it that's always been a part of it. I guess maybe it's just human nature or it's national character, whatever the Olympics were supposed to be from really the beginning of the revival of the games in 1896. I mean, I'm thinking about especially the rivalry between the U.S., and the Brits yes. in 1908 in London. Right. Um, it's been about us versus them, us against them. And of but, course, that's heightened in the Cold War. Right. But remember, again, the, the, the um, World War I is just in the background here. That's right. So there is, it's interesting. It's they the don't, first they scene. Don't, right. They, they don't play it up very much. They have that one scene early on where you see the two war veterans who obviously were uh, damaged by German uh, nerve gas. And there's that interesting, it's an interesting scene, right? Because they're, they're, they're carrying is. the bags of the Cambridge students. And I think one of them says something, this is what we fought the war for, right? That's that right. We, we, our faces are forever damaged. You know, we know in Germany and France and England, there were war cripples be between the wars in the 20s and 30s. And so here, Again, those feelings must have been very raw. Here, the world comes together to compete in athletics, yeah. right? Th that the last time the world was together in this way, they were on a battlefield. And, and, and look, it, Harold Abrahams and, you know, his peers, you know, they fought. He was born in 1899. You know, there, there's a brief mention of it, I think, right at the beginning of the film. But he was lieutenant in the British Army, I think, in 1918, but just missed you know, missed. Um, right, right. Just, Action. just missed the war. Right. You know, wow. which obviously ended on November 11th, and so he actually went into the army before he went to Cambridge. See that that's very interesting, and it fits nicely for what I want to talk about now. It's not just about competing runners, but in a way, not I wouldn't say competing faiths, but a tale of two faiths. Right. That little is a devout Christian and says repeatedly, "I run for God." I feel the Lord in me, right? Very powerful. missionary. As I mean, a missionary. He said, I feel that I'm delivering a message of Christian Christianity through my feet, through the medals that I acquire. And Abraham's is a very different character. On the one hand, we, we're told, he tells us, he won't stop telling us that he's Jewish, but he's at Cambridge. You're telling me he was a lieutenant in World War I for the British. Not he in combat, a, but yes. Without combat, but he's right. obviously in the service. He didn't, you know, he didn't. That's correct. He was a commissioned officer. Remember, he tells, he tells uh, at uh, Keyes College when he's being checked into his room. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the the guy who's kind of in charge of the dormitory. I don't know yeah. what they call it at Cambridge. You know, says, uh, you know, calls him, you know, kid or something like yeah. that. And he says, you know, I. You know, people yeah. stopped calling me that when I was commissioned in, you know, his majesty's army. And I would I'd be much obliged if you if you didn't call me that either. And he knows that or he believes that he's also being called that because he's Jewish. You know, that he believes that everyone is dismissing yes. him in in little ways, the way the British would do it. <laughs> That's right. You know? He says he says a hesitant handshake or a reluctant yes. handshake. Yes, yes. He says, uh, you know, a certain tone in the yes. voice. Yes, and what's interesting about that is that his girlfriend, who's an opera singer, right, is saying it's absurd for you to believe. Light opera. Right, you're, it's absurd <laughs> for you to believe. You're so paranoid that being- She Jewish, says she goes, no one cares. Yeah, she, I love that, Jeremy, you remember? She goes, no one cares. And I'm thinking, well, Kyrie Irving cares. And Kanye he West says- cares. Abraham says, he says, yeah, uh, you know, we're still having these discussions a hundred years later. It's literally a yeah. hundred years later. Yeah. And he says, 
you only say that because you're not Jewish. Exactly. And you happen to be in love with a Jewish student. Right. You know, now that's, you you that know. is fictitious. That relationship is fictitious or I should not fictitious. Uh, Harold Abrahams ended up marrying Sybil uh, in the movie. It's Sybil Gordon is the name of the character, but it's actually 10 years after the Olympics. I see. Marries, right. um, well, I but it's, a, it's an important Hebrew. idea in the movie, though. Right. Don't you think, Jeremy? Because what they're oh, trying to do, it's very explicit. They're, they're it, trying it, to show you this guy is not an East London Jew <laughs> who works in the, you know, who is a tailor or is, you know, a rabbinical student. You know, this is a kid who could not be more British. He's singing I Am an Englishman from right. Gilbert and Sullivan and in a class production. He, he wants to be accepted. He wants to assimilate. He wants to be part of this classist society. Um, he's not rejecting it. He's not fighting against it. He wants, he, he, he says, he says, they'll lead me to water, but they won't let me drink. Right, right. And so you, you can have all these trappings. You can go to Cambridge and you can be on the Olympic team and, um, you know, you can accumulate or amass great wealth, um, but you're still on the outside. Right. And in his case, I think at one point, the college masters, the deans point out he's here because his father is a rich financier. And by the way, this is right out of the Kyrie Irving movie, right? This, this, the, this stereotype of the financial wizardry of Jews, right? So this movie addresses the same- he's, he's a, They say he's a financier in the city. Yes. And I think John Gilgood says, I wonder what that means, which is a strange <laughs> thing for, you know, I think he's, he's the Dean of Magdalen College or whatever at Cambridge, not to know what it means to be a yeah. financier. Yeah. And, he said, and, the, and the other, um, I think the Dean of Keys College says, uh, I think it means he lends money. It's right. kind of like it immediately goes to money lending. It's, it's out of Shylock. It's the Merchant yeah. of Venice, right? So that even here, when you're not in the ghetto, right? This is a kid in Cambridge University that's doing everything possible. His brothers wins. have both graduated, although they don't tell you that in the movie. The real yeah. life, Harold Abrahams, yeah. his brothers both went to Cambridge. You know, his brother had been an Olympian, a two-time Olympian. You know, they don't cover that. It's not right. necessary. But but um, but he's, he's only Jewish to the extent that he's mad about his sense, the sense that he's felt his entire life that people treat him unequally or different because he's Jewish. That's the pre right. you one would argue that the prejudice against him appears to be minimal. <laughs> you know, he's dating the hottest girl on campus. You know, she's an opera singer. All the all the aristocrats he he's goes at to Cambridge. School, he's wealthy. They love well, him. Right. Everyone loves so him. He, it's very interesting thing, and I was thinking about it as I was rewatching it last night because you know, twelve year old me. I have to say, I think all of that was probably lost on me. And I was just interested in the races yeah. and the other stuff and, you know, maybe the Gilbert and Sullivan. But, you know, my memory of it was that the theme of Abraham's Jewishness and outsider status was more subtly addressed. But it's not. It is... It's very, as I said, explicitly addressed. And there are two big conversations, the conversation with Sybil and the conversation with Aubrey Montague. Exactly. Well, who's yeah. actually Evelyn Montague, who went to Oxford, not Cambridge, and was right. better, but that's real life, not the movie. In the movie, Evelyn Aubrey Montague is Aubrey Montague. And, and he's trying to yet again explain to someone who loves him that you're not seeing what my lived reality is. I understand you love me and you don't think this way, but most people in the UK do, and I know it. My father knows it, my brother knows it. We know what it's like to be Jewish. And what's interesting is that it's a little like little in the sense is I'm not running for God, but I'm running because I am a Jew. <laughs> he's saying, I, he's, he's running with a giant chip on his shoulder because of being Jewish, it's his identity yeah. that he's running. It's not really his religion. For instance, maybe we can talk a little about this, that less than 10 years later, maybe, Hank Greenberg, you know, doesn't uh, play it, uh, in a World Series game during Yom Kippur. Uh, Koufax did this later, years right. later. Is there even a sense, because you have an interesting uh, plot conceit here. You have a Christian 
who says, I'm running for God, but not on Sunday. Right. I'm running because God, I'm expressing God through my winning races, but not on a Sunday on right. principle. Is there even a sense that this Jewish runner would not have run on Shabbat or on Yom Kippur? Not that I'm aware of. Um, and, you know, it, it's it's interesting, too. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty well schooled, uh, Thane, on Jewish sports history, et cetera. And I don't, there have been a few athletes, basketball players over the years. One I did a story about when he was in high school, Tamir Goodman, um, uh, who was an orthodox uh, That's basketball That's a kid that player. went to Maryland, right? Didn't he That's go right. To Didn't go to Maryland. He was going to go to Maryland. but oh, they, they wouldn't up. let him play on Shabbat. They wouldn't let or him they take were going, off. They weren't going to make an exemption for exactly, him. Exactly. They were going to. So it's come up on very rare occasions um, whereas, you know, when it does come up, it's typically just the high holy days, you know, it's Yom Kippur and it's Rosh Hashanah, but, but, and, just, but not, ahead. not in the Olympic. And, you know, interestingly, and I don't think I knew this until I was doing some research, you know, Harold Abrahams, unless all the sources that I've been reading were incorrect, converts to Catholicism wow. uh, by 1934. Wow. Well, but it's interesting because I'm wondering, and I don't know if you know the answer to this or your uh, orthopedic friend, surgeon knows. You can always call him up. <laughs> Dr. Malin. <laughs> Dr. Malin, uh, which, you know, this idea that um, were the British upset at Little? Did the British people say, you know, the, the Prince of Wales, for God's sakes, made a special request to you, right? That's like saying Prince Harry came to you and said, I need you to run on Sunday for our nation. It's actually more like Prince William because he was right. the heir to the throne. Exactly, the, the number two right. guy. Yeah. Right, the heir to the throne has a brandy with you and he's taking you in and he's saying to you, well, I don't think a little drinks, right? I don't think. Well, in the movie, um, that's the way it happens, Dane. I that's actually right. think that's how it actually happens. So so I don't, don't think, think they tried to muscle him. Well, what I do know is that Eric Little was aware of the Olympic heat schedule by early January of 1924. So it wasn't on the boat. It was not on the boat two days before the races were going to be run. Right. Um, to the extent that it was a big story in the papers, I just don't know. I find it, I mean, I could be totally wrong. What do I know? I find it unlikely that the Prince of Wales, the future Edward had Edward the eighth got involved. It's a great story. It certainly, I don't think was the, it certainly isn't like in the movie where Lord, they call him Lord Lindsay in the movie, but it's really Lord Burley. That's who the character is based upon. Right. Uh, the future Marquis of Exeter. Who, who actually does <laughs> withdraw from one because out of, out of a sense of honor or gentleman like behavior says, I already have a medal. I don't need another one. Yeah, that's what he does in the movie. That's not what happened in real life. Um, but yeah, but in the in the context of the movie, let's stick to the movie. You know, Lord Lindsay comes in and he says, all right, I've got a simple solution here. Eric is not going to run the 100, no matter what kind of pressure Lord Cadogan and Lord Birkenhead and the Prince of Wales put on him. That's not who he is. And then there's that remarkable moment where the um, other noblemen in the room, the Duke of, I should know this, but I can't remember. The, the Duke says to Lord Birkenhead, I think he says to Lord Birkenhead, he says, that's who Eric Little is. You know, the fact we shouldn't be asking him to sacrifice his principles, you know, for yeah. this. You know, huh. he's, he's as great as he is because of his principles. And, and it's there, that's, it's an interesting moment there, right? Because, you yeah. know, the other, the other guys are kind of it, it, not caricatures, but Lord Burley. They're metal hungry. They right. want more metal. They're metal right. hungry. Right. They're metal um, hungry. Lord Burley's a fascinating guy. We could talk about him all night. You know, as I said, the future Marquis of Exeter, who was a great champion and won a gold medal in 1928, the next Olympics, and I think he won a, I think he won a silver in 32 in L.A. But he's this big figure in you know the Olympic movement for decades upon decades afterwards. And you mentioned earlier, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Right, of course. And the Black Power Salute in 1968 in Mexico City, one of the indelible you know, moments in sports history. And um, um, 
there's there's a man in a red jacket standing there just off the podium. In that's some, him. The famous, that's Lord Burley. Oh, wow, that's great. So um, there's that scene, and this goes to something that we did a few weeks ago in an event. We have a series, uh, Trials and Error, when we look at some of the important legal cases throughout history. We did one that you would love. We did the Muhammad Ali case that went to the Supreme Court oh, wow. on the draft, and we had actually Muhammad Ali's lawyer was there. We had a law clerk from one of the justices there, that one that night. It was really great. We had Rosie Perez, who is wow. oftentimes considered the queen of women's boxing. So we've had these different- Boxing events. period. Yeah. So we did, a, did an event a few weeks ago about the recent Supreme Court cases that have dealt with college of athletics mm. and whether or not college, universities can prevent students from at least getting uh, educational benefits in addition to their scholarships. Yeah. And of course, that led to states allowing for name, image, and likeness. And the reason I'm putting bringing this up, not just to focus on an event that we just did recently, but this comes up in the movie. Because if you think about it, the lunch or the dinner where they invite Abrahams, uh, the two college deans, it I can't tell whether the movie's implying that this is a Jewish issue or it's an amateur issue. In other words, it's at that point that they raise with him, something has been called to our attention that you have a professional coach. Right. And he says, I have a professional coach. He is the finest mind in track and field in the world. He says something like that. Yep. And, they, and, and, he, and they then said, yes, but you're, I, then they go into the sense of amateur status. And mm -hmm. we're, so now we're hearing, this is a hundred years ago. It's like we're hearing the same thing on a university campus today, right? That you are you an amateur or are you a student? Man, this is 12 years after they took away Jim Thorpe's medals. Exactly. One of the great injustices. Great point. Wow. Ever. This is 12 years after that happened. Jim Thorpe, the greatest athlete ever, has that incredible Olympics in Stockholm and he wins the pentathlon and he wins the decathlon. And, and, and they find out later that, you know, he had been playing, you know, semi-pro baseball, collecting a few bucks. A baseball, that was not a sport. He was in the Olympics. Correct. It wasn't, right? you know, he and, got paid they, for a different sport. And they take it away and they take the medals away. And, you know, he just got reinstated as the sole champion yeah. in those events a few weeks ago. So um, what, what do you, so yeah, that scene, how do you interpret scene? See, it seems to me it's a little connected to the financier scene. It's I think little. that's fair. I think, I think part of it, I think, I think the, what they're talking about is the amateurism professional issue. And of course, you know, in England, uh, in Great Britain, more than anywhere else, you know, that divide was keenly felt. And, you know, it, it was, and these rules, frankly, were created to keep the working class from competing against the rich kids. Right. The kids at rugby where they, you know, invented these sports and the kids at Eaton and, and, um, you know, it's so, a, well, oh, you can't compete in the Olympics. You can't compete in our championships. If you're a professional, you know, that's, that's outrageous. Well, what's the practical effect of that? That means, you know, rich people can compete because they right. can focus on it and, and the working class can't. Um, and that those, that's really the origins, right. Of the professional amateur divide. Um, and so they're, you know, you know, but remember, it, unlike Thorpe, Abrahams is not getting paid. So right. If, he's if, not. And he says that I am an amateur. Right. And I am dedicated to the amateur ideal. But they that's not good enough. For them having a professional coach to them is this close to being a professional yourself. And and they kind of after Abrahams, um, you know, to his credit in the film kind of tells them off. You know, then you see uh, Gilgood, and I'm, I'm I'm forgetting the other uh, actor's name, but he was a great director primarily. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they're they're like, well, you know, they kind of say it without saying it. You know, you know, it's a new world, and you know, he's from a different place than us. That's yeah, kind of right. You know. And again, Abrams, if he was there, Abrahams would he would say, yeah, and that, that what they mean by that, I'm Jewish. You know, right. they, he might say, because I think one of them uses the word, word, I think I wrote it down. They think something, play the tradesman. Like you should right. yeah. play the trades. It's an interesting term of art, Jeremy, right? It's if to say, this is just wholly inappropriate.
for you to play as if you have recruited a, something here that deals with trade, with right. financing, with money in something right. that is so pure. Lucre. Yes, lucre, right. That you have, you have, you've, in, you've, you've contaminated the concept of the, your amateur status. By right. the, and they have, you know, he says, you know, you are, you are um, dishonoring the ideals yes. of Cambridge. Right, you know, right. In and so he, many words. Right. And he, and we know from watching the movie that he's, you know, <laughs> he's like a star at Cambridge in every way. He's brought, brought them glory. And yet they're complaining. And there's that great little moment where they say, you know, it, it's as if it's getting worse and worse. And he's an Italian, your coach. And yeah. what is, I forgot, he says, and he's also an Arab, right? It, or they ask him, is, is, is he Italian? His name is Musabini. And he says, well, actually, he's Italian and Arab. <laughs> Which I love that there's yeah. an Arab. And, and Gilgood and, and the other dean are like, more shot now, yeah. right? Because there's no Italians or Arabs at Cambridge at all. And there wouldn't, there weren't going to be at that point. It's, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's about, you know, it's the Abraham story. It's about class. It's about assimilation. It's about, but he wanted to be part of this, but he wanted yeah. to be part of it on his own terms. Right. And, and, and right, because it, unlike others who might have, you know, he assimilated, but there was a limit to his assimilation, even though he eventually, as you say, converts to Catholicism. It's like there's something burning inside him, you know, yeah. like Disraeli, by the way, was a Jewish British novelist who eventually converts to Catholicism and becomes, you know, the great prime minister of Victorian England. And people forget we're talking about a Jewish novelist. But, you know, I don't know, it, it, you know, I, I don't my 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 recollection. I and I could be totally wrong. I thought Disraeli's father converted. Oh, you're saying he he was raised. I Catholic. thought he was raised. You may be in the right. Church of you England. may be right. But but yeah. but but the difference is it doesn't appear. I, and at least I don't know. I've never read that Disraeli feels any conflict that his family starts out as Sephardic Jews, you know, right. that that there's no conflict for Abraham's. It, it is a conflict because on one hand, you'd say his friends and his girlfriend are right. He, you know, he's not really feeling it in any great way. He's feeling it more. He's hypersensitive. And, to, and, and, and right. Like, so they're having these conversations thing, right? It's 1922, 1923, 1924. And literally, you know, they're saying to him, what are you talking about? Nobody <laughs> cares. Yeah. This is, this is, 12 years before the 36 Olympics. This is just nine years before the Nazis come to power. I mean, and, and a book that you wrote covers this very same subject, which is a nice little segue, Jeremy, because in no. 1936 in Berlin, and I honestly don't know, you know, because you wrote a book about this, but there seems to be a lot of people of different minds about the American track team that had Two Jews from Brook, from New York, uh, Marty Glickman. One from New York. Oh, Sam, what, Sam Stoller was Sam not Sam Stoller was from Cincinnati. So they were both in the four by four, uh, right? They were, four they by were 100. in the, the hundreds. They each ran, right. They ran legs in a hundred. And that on the day of that race, they were told, and the answer is like, who? how did this come to be? We know that Hitler had eliminated Jews from the German team. And we, I've seen documentaries, you've probably seen, you know, there were, especially uh, in Austria, uh, Jewish Austrians were really uh, very plentiful on the Olympics teams. For some reason, Jewish athletes in Austria made the Olympic games. And so there was a high jumper, I think, that was prevented from jumping in the 36 Olympics. Reynold Bergman. Yeah. And, and Lean Meyer. And yeah, there were, there were a number it of, was, it was all scandalous. Basically what they did was, you know, they're, they're, you know, they were asked to be in compliance and basically just asked. No one forced them with the Olympic uh, idea of letting everybody compete. And they said, well, you know, you know, it's not our fault that the Jews aren't qualifying for our team. And meanwhile, they had outlawed all the Jewish sports clubs and you could only qualify through a sports club. And so it was it was this ridiculous game they were playing to exclude the Jews. But, and then but, ultimately but they they. I, as I recall, it's been a long time since I wrote the book. There were a couple of Jews that they allowed on the team basically just to take the heat off. I see. 
But so there is some question. I mean, so because people remember the 36 Olympics of how the master race, the per professed master race, gets beaten by an African American traveling to Berlin and just crushes them and wins, I don't know, what, five medals? I can't Four remember. Four gold how. medals. Four gold medals, right. <clears throat> but there's that other piece of it, right? Which is that there were two Jews on the relay who were not permitted to run. And it's still not clear, not clear to me why. Jesse Owens eventually takes one of their places and then another African-American takes another place. And it could be that they were in fact faster with the two African-Americans. Uh, is this right? Because remember- There's no doubt just... about that. Ralph Metcalf and Jesse Owens were the two best sprinters in the world. The question is uh, always has come down to what happened with Sam Stoller and Marty Glickman. There were six sprinters who were in consideration for the four by 100. And it was Foy Draper and Frank Wyckoff and Ralph Metcalf and Jesse Owens and Sam Stoller and Marty Glickman. And um, it's complicated. Uh, I deal with it in my book. Ultimately, the American track coaches, Lawson Robertson and Dean Cromwell, uh, decide to keep Glickman and Stoller on the sidelines. They do not get to compete. They do not get medals. Um, and Draper this is not because run. Joseph Goebbels, to your knowledge, this is not because Hitler told Goebbels that we don't want Jews winning medals at the Berlin game. When I wrote the book 15 years ago, there was no evidence that that happened. You know, the, the assumption has long been, rather than something from the Germans saying, don't do this, that there was a certain deference shown. I see. Um, from Avery Brundage, who was the head of the American Olympic Committee, and possibly from the track and field coaches as well, Robertson and Cromwell. You know, there's another school of thought that Dean Cromwell uh, just wanted his runners who had been at USC, where he was the coach, that was Draper and Wyckoff to compete. Um, you know, the people who were in the room, Frank Wyckoff thought anti-Semitism was part of it. Marty Glickman thought anti-Semitism was a part of it. Sam Stoller did not. Um, so it, it's complicated. But, you know, you just reminded us of the scene in the film, uh, Chariots of Fire, in which Lord, he had a different name in the film, it's Lindsay, but you've described Bur him. Burley, Lord Burley. Burling you know, does this, you know, incredible act of generosity and honor because the argument is, you know, spread the medals around. Give, that's what sportsmanship would allow. Right. So it's not clear. I just recently read, in fact, I, I think I mentioned it to you offhandedly, that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was Lou Alcindor in 1968, had his one chance in those days, as we know, only collegians could play in the basketball Olympics and so, and he was the best player in the country at the time. And he chose not to play in 1968. And I read that he said it's because of Avery Brundage, who by 1968 was, had even a more important position. Yeah, by, by that time, he'd been the head of the International Olympic Committee for about, what, 30 years. So he went from being the head of the American Committee Correct. to the International. Uh, Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar said, this is an incredible anecdote. If it's true, Jabbar says, especially when Jabbar is saying this with Kyrie Irving and Kanye West says, I didn't play because Avery Brundage, who was the head of the International Olympic Committee, wouldn't allow two Jewish sprinters mm. to sprint in 1936. And huh. I read that. I saw it in a quote in the Times and I saw one recently on Substack. That it, that Kareem has now said now in particular he's being asked this question because of what Kyrie Irving has said. He's yeah. you know there's been several basketball players, Charles Barkley for one, uh, and well, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar Abdul has written some powerful stuff, really yeah. powerful stuff. Yeah, um, and if this is know. true that he on in in on principle because two Jewish players and he's saying. That was the year that Jesse Owens lit up the world. And I should be thankful that they didn't run because that gave Jesse even more, you mm. know, honor, more medals. But in fact, he says, no, I just, I'm, I, re, I'm, I respond to raw prejudice. This mm. is raw prejudice. Yeah. Well, Avery Brundage was... There, there, we, we could say a lot about Avery. Well, can, why don't you tell the audience, and I think you know, tell our viewers uh, where Brundage comes up again in 1972, 
four yeah, well, years in after. 72, you know, um, after the massacre in Munich and the Israeli athletes and coaches are killed, German policemen as well. Uh, you know, Brundage is in charge of the Olympics still at this point in 72. And, you know, they're still competing in the hours after um, the hostages have been taken and two of the Israelis have been killed. And there's a memorial service uh, the next day and Brundage is speaking at the memorial service. And if you go back and you read the columns that Red Smith wrote from Munich and they're just, you know, he's seething at Brundage's um, lack is of it, sensitivity. It, it, is it obtuseness? Huh? Is it obtuseness or is it anti-Semitism? What is it? You know, I I, I can't um, I can't look at Avery lack of Brundage empathy. Hard. I what think it's it? all those things. Look, you know, Avery Brundage, you know, was against uh, his teammate Jim Thorpe. He was a decathlon athlete in 1912, the same Olympics as Thorpe. He was against Thorpe getting his medals back. Wow. Uh, he was for the United States going to Berlin and Garmisch Partenkirchen in 1936. You know, he he was totally. Um, on the side of those who said, no, it doesn't make a difference. You know, what's going on in Germany? We go, the Olympics go. And in 72, at this memorial service, after, you know, this terrible tragedy, he equates it to the political pressure that came, uh, the political pressure that was put on the IOC um, um, uh, leading up to the games by some African nations. I'm trying to remember the exact details. But it's basically because, you know, the IOC had not banned, I think it was Rhodesia, or maybe it was New Zealand for competing against Rhodesia. I'm forgetting the details. But, you know, you've had this murder and, and he's airing his grievances about how he felt the IOC had been pressured into this political accommodation for these African nations, which had every right to be pissed off at the IOC and what was going on. But that's who he was. Right. So do you think, given the events of the last several weeks with Kyrie Irving and Kanye West, uh, the idea here, you know, that, you know, Jews, and we've seen this in the cancel culture, Jews are seen as privileged white people. And so, you know, there's there's a lack of an understanding of history of anti-Semitism. Mm. Does this film, is this a film that would have been good for Kyrie Irving to watch after he saw the documentary? Or would he say, this is a movie about a rich Jewish guy who goes to Cambridge University, right? It's really about a white guy who's Jewish that feels some nominal anti-Semitism, but he ends up winning a gold medal. In what way is this a sign? This is not the Holocaust. Now, again, it foreshadows 36. Now in 36, we're getting a foreshadowing of the Holocaust in 19... You know, 24, we're, we're, we don't have anything. We're just at, at the end, you know, we're, we're only 24 years away from the Dreyfus affair, you know? So we're like in between the Holocaust and the Dreyfus affair. We're in a, in a, in a, in a gray zone, so to speak, right? No one is, no one is imagining a genocide of Jewish people. So th this film, on the one hand, while it's about anti Semitism, really isn't. And so I'm wondering whether this leaves the message. And the reason you reminded me of it is, I'm 10 years older than you, and I'm not even sure when I was in college, I picked up on how the film was really about anti-Semitism. Yeah. You know, that the young Jeremy Schaap also thought it was about running and, you know, right. an older Thane Rosenbaum didn't really focus on that, but it is clear, it's explicit. Yeah, it, it is. And much more so, as I said, than I remember. I mean, it's, you know, the anti-Semitism that Harold Abrahams experiences is a central part of the story. But, you know, what you see in terms of anti-Semitism directed at him, you, you hear him talk about it. As I said, the reluctant handshake, the, you know, kind of snide remarks. There's something that he detects, you know, but, um, you know, there's, there's nothing in, in this movie that would lead you to think, this is what's coming. But if Dick, if yeah, Dick Schaap was sharing our screen, which would have been awesome, by the way, and, I'm, and you would have loved that. <laughs> would too. have been. Would have been awesome. He was sharing the screen. I would probably turn to him right now and say, do you see a line between 1924, 1936, and 1972? You know, it just seems that the Jewish sensibility, Jewish history, Jew anti-Semitism, prejudice, 
exclusion, amateurism, all those things around in, in a Jewish setting, there's a through line there. And oh, it's there's, no, there's no doubt. And, and, and it's, yeah, it is fascinating. Um, you know, the Harold Abraham story, you know, he, he goes on to become this dean of the British track and field community, yeah. along with Lord Burley. Um, and, you know, he, he, uh, I believe he's still the only Jewish 100 meter world uh, Olympic gold medal. World's fastest man. Um, <laughs> uh, world's fastest man. I think I think he's still the only one. And um, you know what what he experiences is kind of it. it what what he's describing might seem insignificant compared to what we know is coming, right? Yeah. But it is part of the same through line. The idea that you know, that anti-Semitism can exist without dire consequences. You know, that's a falsehood. And, and, and um, it's, it's, it's this ancient disease, right? And, and, you know, there are times when it's um, more present as we're feeling now, experiencing now, and times when it's more subtle, which is what Ar Harold Abrahams is talking about. Um, and, and then, you know, that, that world and Harold Abrahams is in Berlin in 1936, covering those Olympic games. Um, it's, it, yeah, I, I mean, Harold Abrahams to me, you know, his story is about being an outsider trying to get, which is what they say in the current season of the crown. Right. And, you know, the character of Dodi Fayed who produced the movie movie, right. You know, and, talks and, about what it's about. It's about, right. Uh, an outsider, you know, and trying to break into English society, um, that class society, the aristocracy, and, and, and how difficult that can be. Um, but the movie but, you know, is a so cautionary. There's a universality to the Abraham story as well. But there's a it's a cautionary tale, Jeremy, right? Because the 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 it, since we know what happened in '36. And then the Holocaust in 72 and today, what happened in the last several weeks, you know, because we can look back on that, we could say Abraham's is on to something. You know, it doesn't work. No, you know, he's could, not making it up. Yeah, you can. But I'm saying it doesn't go away. And even, you know, as successfully as he assimilated, he was so good at it. Right. It did. It didn't go away. You know, there's a really good film, Sunshine. Starring Ralph, yeah, the Dan Hungarian Martin. about the Hungarian, right, Hungarian film. It's a Holocaust film, but it's an Olympic film also. That's right. He's a fencer. He's a fencer, a Jewish fencer, and he keeps saying, "I won gold medals for Austria. I'm Viennese. I'm a Viennese Jew." And it doesn't. And by the way, the play on Broadway. So was it Vienna now, or Budapest? I thought it was Budapest. Oh, it's Budapest. And, Budapest, and, right. and the play that's on Broadway, the Tom Stoppard play yeah. on Broadway, Leopold Scott is covering that same. We're seeing variations of the same thing, which is. There's a kind of delusion, right? That, you know, yes, you're privileged. Yes, you're assimilated. But in the end, it's not clear whether the ancient prejudices don't resurface even in murderous ways. Of course. And, 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 and you know, that's why it's so scary, right? And, um, and even, it just remains scary. What, you know, last year I, I wrote something about, um, when there a couple of years ago, when um, there were some anti-Semitic incidents in sports about, you know, the picture that I look at in my office over here, I've got a picture of my great, great grandfather. Uh, who came, he was the Shap who came here in the 1870s from. Was he a Shap or was he a Shapiro? He was a Shap. And you don't want to know why I know that? Because one of my board members asked me. <laughs> said, oh, really? Yeah, well, because they because they, no. they said something. All the Shaps of Pennsylvania are Shapiro's. No, well, I remember there was the governor, Milton Shap. Yes, it was right. spelled differently. Uh, so Shap, the way we spell it, S-C-H-A-A-P, is a very common Dutch name. When I was growing up in Manhattan, the only Shaps in the phone book were close relatives of mine. There were like oh, wow. three or four of them. And I went to Amsterdam, and there are pages. Uh, of Shaps. Uh, it just means sheep in Dutch. That's all. And it's been the family name since 1714. And he came over in the 1870s. And uh, I wrote an essay about this. And, you know, his all of his siblings stayed. Uh -huh. And, you know, what, what happened? What happened 70 years later? What happened to Anne Frank left. happened to those Shaps? 
That's right. right and I they, get these he, updates. He was Dutch. The, the, the shafts were Dutch. And right. the same I, thing happened. I, I get these updates every couple of days, um, email updates from one of the genealogy websites that I'm signed up on. And I have a cousin in Australia, a distant cousin, who keeps filling in information. And it's, it's you know, it's it's horrible. You know, he, he fills in information about all these relatives, people in our family tree. And, you know, you see born in 1900, and then you look down and, you know, Auschwitz, 1942, Auschwitz, wow. 1943, Auschwitz, wow. 1944. And, and I think about my great-great-grandfather, uh, Moritz Schapp, who, got, who, who came over here and how, you know, that's, that's everything. I have one last question and we'll say goodnight to Jeremy. This goes to the idea of the Massabini relationship with Abrahams. And the reason I'm asking, you wrote a book on uh, Braddock uh, and we, you know, we know that he had this incredible relationship, by the way, with a Jewish manager slash coach. Yep. Uh, so an Irish boxer and a Jewish manager slash coach during the Depression. Um, it does seem that this relationship between athletes and their coaches makes for interesting drama, whether it's Rocky or yep. Hoosiers, right? It's interesting. A, a league of their own, right? <laughs> with with Tom Hanks, right? It's it, There's no accident that when people are setting to write sports movies, Many of them involve relationships with cult with uh, coaches. You know, when you were talking before about that scene with Aubrey, I was reminded of when Massabini, in uh, after they win the Olympic medal, he takes Massabini to get loaded at a bar. Yes, and they get wasted. Yes, and it made me think he might have had a father relationship with this Arab uh, track coach that might have been more intimate than with his own Jewish father. You know, that it might have been, that scene was there to show you, you know, cause when you, the point, the scene that you point out that he's crying and he smashes his hands. Yeah. It's as if my son just wanted- I to think go he says my son. Yes, I, exactly. He says my son. He says my son, my son. And yeah. then later we see them celebrating together. So I just wonder whether you have any thoughts before we say good night about, that it seemed that Mickey and Rocky, you know, there's a very no, similar. I mean, it's, think about it. I mean, you know, there aren't many relationships like that, right? Where one person, uh, you know, it, now it's different in individual sports and team sports. You know, my dad wrote six books about the Green Bay Packers and Vince Lombardi is, you know, such a big figure in, uh, in, in our sports mythology, obviously, and, and, and coaches, et cetera. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention today, one of my father's best friends, we found out he died. Not sure if Nick died today or yesterday, but Nick Bollettieri, the greatest tennis coach of all time, died at 90. Was he, was he a friend of your father's? They were very close friends. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I was sad to hear the news and I, I, I love Nick. Um, but, you know, he was one of those guys with those intense relationships with Andre Agassi and Monica Sellis and Jimmy Arias. And, you know, it's, you know, they it's, made, they made a documentary about that, which was, that's right. That's right. That? What was this called? Love, love, something, love, something, love. Right. Like, and it, right, right, right. It, it, there's yeah. a, there's a brutal love, you know, it's, it's, it's beyond love. There's something in that movie. That and, shows... and, 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 right. And, and it's a complicated relationship, right? Yes. Because you're, 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 you're working so hard. So, Another person can achieve this, but you're also part of the achievement. And, you know, and yeah. it's it's how much credit. So there's something there that's very rich to be mined, I guess, when you're talking about these kinds of stories. It, it's, it's an interesting coincidence. And it does seem to be a hook that we all of us find very compelling in a way that might transcend teacher-student relationships, you know, employer-employee relationships. There's something about leaving it all out on the field. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's something about the, the sort of the exhaustion of and what it takes and who gets you there. Yeah, and no, when it, I think about, you know, the great coaches that I've been around and, and, they're, and they're so different, you know, there are the motive, they're the Vince Lombardi's, you know, with the great speeches. And then there yeah. are the people who, you know, who are more of the uh, Bill Belichick variety who don't, you know, quite give you the, uh, the Newt Rockney speech. One quick, one quick last question. I should question. say Knut, but Knut Rockney. It was right? Newt, but now it's Knut. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're Dutch. So you would, you would pronounce He's all He's Norwegian. Those. You would Norwegian, <laughs> right. But you would, you would know to pronounce all those, all the, right. all the consonants, you know, to pronounce. Right. Don't, don't leave them out. One <laughs> last question before we go, uh, because I want to end on a romantic note. 
Uh, we think of the Olympics nowadays, we think of doping and scandals and controversies, people taking a knee, protesting, all kinds of issues around the politics. You mentioned about Rhodesia, right? The politicization of it. One thing about this film, it does give us the romance of the Olympics in a way. Sure. And I wonder if you can, if you have anything you might might add about that, that there's something, given your father wrote a book yeah. about this, that there's a certain purity to it that is irresistible that the Greeks did contemplate. And that when you're not yeah. thinking of doping, it is special. I'm glad you're, you're bringing that up, Thane, because, you know, I spent so much time, as you mentioned, you know, earlier talking about the yeah. issues. Sports, Dark and controversies, stuff. And, you know, all of that stuff. And then there is, you know, the stuff when I was 12 years old that, you know, I found just enchanting, you know, in the competition. And, and one thing that sometimes gets lost, you know, the sheer beauty of what they're doing physically, yes. right? Yes. Fastest people in the world. The yes. people, you know, who, who can do the, you know, whether you're watching figure skating at the Olympics or gymnastics at the Olympics or track and field or basketball, you know, it's, it's not just about, you know, nation competing against nation and, you know, personal achievement. It's about um, the, the physical element of it. And because they, it's not just, it's also, they look beautiful doing it. It's not just the beauty of what Some they did. do. You know, uh, right. Emil Zatopek, the great yes. Czech runner, he was, Red Smith famously wrote that he looked, he ran like a man with a noose around his neck, you know, that he, he was in such pain, it seemed, yeah, with every yeah, step yeah. that he took. So yeah. distance runners kind of fall into a different category. I think Pavo Nermi, who was the other great star of the 1924 Olympics, you know, who had his best Olympics in 1924, the great flying fin. Don't get me started on Nermi. We could be here all yeah. night, Dane. Um, you know, uh, I don't know how beautiful he was to watch. Well, Maybe you know, Eric maybe. Little, at least the character who plays him, I wondered whether that's an exaggerated running style in the movie. Because yes, there's kind of an extreme way that they depict. Uh, yes. And I wonder uh, whether that's running. The... He was known for running, you know, so hard that he would collapse at the end of a race. I see. And that happened. But, he, but I yeah. also thought that it picks up on the metaphor, the theme of, you know, I'm the a God is within me that I'm expressing, you know. Yeah, and I feel God's pleasure when presence, I'm, pleasure and, yeah. and all and, right, Jeremy. Before we I'm say sorry. goodnight, I think we I have. Could, we could go on and on. It was a blast. So before we say goodnight, I think we've got. What do we have? Uh, yes, our just closing remarks. We do have another conversations on essential cinema. It is coming up. I think it's early January. We had a great guest and a great film, but she told me not to tell anybody. So it's coming up. Stay tuned. Sign up for folks.org. Uh, if you, it's not too late to Forgiving Tuesdays, we haven't been charging uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we like to think we're one of your favorite uh, 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 nonprofits. And I think Jeremy Schapp is a good example of what we're able to do. This was a really fascinating conversation with one of the most important writers and thinkers and broadcasters on the sports world today. Jeremy, you are an American treasure and you come from a treasured family uh, in sports uh, journalism. And I'm thrilled to call you my friend. And I'm thrilled Thank to you. always watch you on television and read you. I'm really um, flattered. So flattered. Sincerely said, Jeremy. I'm great. Thane Rosenbaum for folks. Until next time, good night.